Hey guys, I have your notes here for section 4-7, day one. And um, I would like you to, before we get started with these notes, I would like you to go, if you have access to this, grab a red marker and a blue marker, or a red colored pencil and a blue colored pencil, crayon, highlighter, whatever. Take a minute, see if you can find something like that. Pause the video. Now, the reason I want you to do this is because we're gonna, we're gonna mark up your notes today. And this is where I've said, remember me saying all this time, I'm gonna be super picky about how you write this because it's gonna get harder later. Today's the day. Actually, tomorrow it's gonna get even more difficult. So keep in mind, whenever you see this abbreviation, this has to follow. You have to have an angle here. You should never, ever, ever write sine equals. You always have an angle in this spot. Your answer to the problem is always a fraction. That's what you've been doing leading up to now. We've done a little bit of inverses. This is what we're going to be really focusing on today. This is sine inverse. This is not sine to the negative one power. That is something completely different. We're not doing that right now. You've got to be able to read and interpret, use, use the context of what we're doing to know how to say this. This is sine inverse, not sine to the negative one power. If I hear you say sine to the negative one power, I'm going to strangle you. Okay, I might not have, maybe I shouldn't have said that on video. Um, I didn't just say that. Uh, no, don't say sine to the negative one power. You read this as sine inverse or the inverse of sine. Okay? Now, when you see the inverse, remember inverses is when we swap our x and y, or we swap our input and output. So this means my fraction and angle spots have had to swap positions because we're doing an inverse problem. So whenever you see this abbreviation, sine inverse, the spot that immediately follows it has to be a fraction. Your answer to this type of problem is going to be an angle, like 30 degrees, or pi over 4, 7 pi over 6, something like that. Your answer to this type of problem is going to be an angle. Now, I want to show you some graphs down here just to make sure you remember kind of what we're doing here. And I'm not really crazy about this sine graph because I wish it went backwards a little farther. Okay. So when you're looking at the sine graph, keep in mind, we are still talking about angles from 0 to 90 to 180 to 270 all the way to 360. And for a sine graph, for y equals sine x, the angle goes here. Our answer to the problem is a fraction. So this is what you did on your intro paper. You came up with all your sine fractions. So you looked at angles between 0 and 90, and you wrote down all your fractions. Well, then, of course, you changed them to decimals so that you could graph them. Now, did you make the connection that from here to here, these are all angles in quadrant one, and all of your fractions, your y values, were positive. All of your sine fractions were positive in quadrant one. Check this out. Now you have angles between 90 and 180. You have obtuse angles. What can you tell me about those y values? What can you tell me about the sine fractions? Those were still all positive. How about angles in quadrant 3 from 180 to 270? Now all the fractions are negative. Why? Because of ASTC. All are positive in quadrant 1. Sine, cosine, and tangent. All fractions, no, no. Sine only is positive in quadrant 2. Tangent only is positive in quadrant 3. Thus, my sine fractions are negative. Cosine only fractions are positive in quadrant 4. Thus, my sine fractions are negative in quadrant 4. And that, that goes for the same as cosine as well. Um, 
If I look at angles in just quadrant one, see this? My cosine fractions are positive. How about angles in quadrant two? My y values, my cosine fractions are negative because of a, s. Quadrant three, my cosines are negative because of a, s, t. Quadrant four, my cosines are positive because of a, s, t, c, and so on. Anyway, that wasn't my point. My point is, ready? Take your pencil. Do a vertical line test on the sine function. Does it pass? Of course it does. You know what that means? Of course you do. It means sine of x is a function. All right, do the horizontal line test on it. Do the horizontal line test on sine of x. Oh, fails. You know what that means? Mm, not as many people knew what this means this time. It means the inverse is not a function. Big deal, what's that mean? Who cares? Here's what it means. If the inverse is not a function, then when I do an inverse problem, I have way too many answers as possibilities. Let me say that again. Let it sink in. Horizontal line test fails. What's that mean? The inverse is not a function. Big deal. What's that mean? It means when I do an inverse problem, there are too many answer possibilities. When I do an inverse problem, there are too many answers as possibilities. Well, what the heck? What are we going to do? How am I going to know if I get the right answer? Somebody came up with a way to just say, oh, no, no, uh -uh. let's limit all of our possibilities. Instead of having a million angles that we could say is the right answer, we're going to limit it. You're going to be limited when you do this type of problem. So let me show you how to come up with your limits. These are super important. Here we go. We're going to look at the sine graph. And imagine for a moment that you're Doug in, the, in uh, the movie Up and you're wearing a cone of shame. So you're very limited on what you can see. You know, you can't see stuff out here and you can't see stuff out here. And so you're wearing your cone of shame. I'm going to walk up to the graph. I want to walk up to the sign graph so that in my cone of shame, the portion of the graph that I'm looking at passes the horizontal line test. Now, I could walk, there are so many places where I could walk up to the sine graph and it would pass the horizontal line test. I want the biggest range possible, I want the biggest x interval possible, and get it closest to the origin. Where do you see closest to the origin I could wear my cone of shame and pass the horizontal line test? Can I do it here? No, still fails. Can I do it here? Yes, but can, can you make it, can you make that region bigger? I think I can make this region bigger by including angles back here. So if I just look at from here, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, to there, it would pass. The horizontal line test. So we are going to limit ourselves so that all we see all we see is from there to there. So that that part that I highlighted in pink does it it does it pass the horizontal line test? It does. Okay so here's the thing. Remember how I said Your answer to this type of problem is going to be an angle, and there are too many possibilities. Okay, here's how I'm going to limit you. Because of what we just narrowed down on our sine graph, you may only, you may only use angles from 0 to 90, positive, acute, 
angles. You may use those angles as answers. Also, zero to negative 90. You may use negative acute angles. When you do a sine inverse problem, that's how I'm going to limit your answers. Why? Because we found something close to the origin. We found a place where we can use the, vert the, sorry, the horizontal line test. Okay, check out cosine real quick. Again, as close to the origin as possible. Where can you, where can you limit with your cone of shame so that your region that you're looking at passes the horizontal line test? Can you use the same place that we did for sine? Can you look from negative 90 to positive 90? No. No. Not good for cosine. Stay close to the origin, though. Where could I look? Well, where would I pass the horizontal line test? I think if I only limited myself from here to here, I can't go back up because then it would fail. But from here to here, it would pass the horizontal line test. That portion of cosine passes the horizontal line test. So what angles does that give us? How are we limited on our angles? Well, the only angles we're going to be able to use are from 0, stop here, so 0 to 180. That's it. That's all you got. You don't have negatives like you did on sine. Tangent, kind of same concept. Uh, tangent fails the horizontal line test. It's okay. Put on your cone of shame. Where can you go, close to the origin, so that you see a region of the graph that passes the horizontal line test? I think it's the same as sine, right? If I'm wearing my cone of shame and I'm only looking from negative 90 to positive 90, doesn't this portion right here, just that piece, Doesn't that piece pass the horizontal line test? It does. We're going to limit ourselves to that. What were those angles again? Those angles would be zero to 90 and zero to negative 90. Same as sine. So my tangent inverse limitations are going to be the same as my sine inverse limitations. Now, in your notes up here, you've got all three of those pieces graphed for you. Um, the part that I highlighted, the part that I said we this passes the horizontal line test. So for sine, we're looking at angles from negative 90 to positive 90. See how this portion passes the horizontal line che test. Check. Cosine. From 0 to 180 is what we're going to look at. See how this portion passes the horizontal line test. Tangent, negative 90 to positive 90. See how this portion passes the horizontal line test. What does that do for us? That guarantees us an answer. One. That guarantees us one answer to an inverse because originally I had way too many possible answers. And since we're wearing our cone of shame, we're only going to look at certain regions of the graph. It's going to limit us to one answer. Alrighty, so these three problems are the type of problems you're going to be doing today. You're going to be doing sine inverse, cosine inverse, and tangent inverse. You will see a fraction following each abbreviation. Your answer each time to every single problem will be an answer. My answer will be an angle. My answer will be an angle. My answer will be an angle. Okay? Limitations. When you do this type of problem, you are limited to positive acute angles from quadrant one. Or, remember how we went backwards on the graph? you might also have a negative 
acute angle from quadrant four. So any angle in this semicircle is a possibility for an answer to this question. But wait, if we're gonna, if you're gonna answer from quadrant four, it has to be, you have to answer it with a negative acute angle, not what you typically think of in quadrant four. You typically think of quadrant four is between positive 270 and positive 360. Well, get that out of your head today because positive 270 is way out of our cone of shame. Our cone of shame, when we looked at that graph, only showed us positive acute angles and negative acute angles, like backwards. Anytime you have an inverse sine problem, your answer must come from this quadrant or this quadrant. If it comes from this quadrant, it's a negative acute angle. All right, cosine. In case you have forgotten, cosine, we said all angles from zero to pi are in our cone of shame. Here's what that looks like. When you do this kind of problem, your answer must come from zero to pi. Your answer will be a positive acute angle or your answer will be a positive obtuse angle. That's it. Those are the only choices you have for an answer for cosine inverse. Moving on. Tangent inverse. Whenever you see this type of problem, your answer, you have a limited set of angles for your answer, and it was the same as sine. Remember, we said we could put our, on our cone of shame, we could see that one piece of the tangent. Our answer can be a positive acute angle from quadrant one or a negative acute angle from quadrant four, not something from 270 to 360. That's way out of our cone of shame. Okay, you got your limitations down? These little semicircles are gonna have to be memorized. You are gonna have to remember, lock them in your head. This type of problem, these are your limitations. This type of problem, these are your limitations. This type of problem, these are your limitations. Lock them in, write them on a piece of paper 20 times. Now, I think I want to just start off with some straight up inverse problems so that you kind of get the hang of it. And then I'll throw some other stuff out at you. Let's just have you kind of get the hang of it at first. So, um, equals, equals, equals. I want you to, I want, this is where you're gonna use a marker. What are we looking at right here? What follows the inverse abbreviation? Nice. These are fractions. What should our angles be? Mm -hmm. Our angle, no, sorry. What, I gave that one away, didn't I? What should our answers be? Our answers should be angles. And it doesn't tell me to, but hey, let's do these in radians, because radians is more fun. Don't you think so by now? I'm kind of curious to see who's with me. Who likes radians better than degrees at this point? I'll find out later. Anyway, ready? So, sine inverse. First thing I'm going to do, after I've, after I've marked these up, I recognize this is a fraction. My answer has to be an angle. I have, I have limitations for sine inverse. Sine inverse. My answer has to come from quadrant one, positive acute angle, or quadrant four, negative acute angle. How do I know where my answer comes from? Hmm. See this fraction? Is it positive, like sine fractions in quadrant one? Or is it negative, like sine fractions in quadrant four? It's positive. So that means my answer, my angle, The type of problem had me limited to these two quadrants. The fact that this is positive says, oh, it's got to be in quadrant one. So my answer, what, what angle, what quadrant one angle has a sine fraction of radical two over two? It's pi over four. 
That's an angle. That's your answer. Let's try another one. That's a fraction. This is going to be an angle. We're doing a cosine inverse problem. Semicircle. Set it up. That's what the limitations are for cosine inverse. So you're either going to give me an answer that's an angle from quadrant one, positive and acute, or you're going to give me an answer that's an angle from quadrant two, obtuse. My answer is going to either be an acute angle or an obtuse angle. Now, this type of problem here are my limitations. This is a negative fraction. Where are my cosine fractions negative? Cosine fractions are negative here. So, hmm. what's a reference angle that has a cosine fraction of radical 3 over 2? Cosine radical, ooh, pi over 6. Right? Doesn't a pi over 6 angle has a, have a reference or have a fraction of radical 3 over 2? Okay. Give me an angle in quadrant two that has this as a reference. It's got to have the same denominator. It's almost to six pi over six, but not quite. Five pi over six, that's the angle that's my answer. Next one, sine inverse, you're limited. You're limited. This type of problem, we're limited to these two quadrants. My sine fraction is negative. Where are sine fractions negative? Here. So let me figure out what my reference angle would be first, and then we can figure out what the angle is in quadrant Four. So, radical 3 over 2. Ready? Sine radical 3 over 2. Here we go. You with me? A pi over 3 angle has this fraction. Sine fraction. But since this is negative, I need to take my, I need to take my pi over 3, put it in quadrant 4. That would be a negative pi over 3. Remember, I'm not going all the way around. I'm limited. It has to be, the angle has to be super close to zero. If I go all the way around to here, I've gone way beyond my limitations. Okay, now, having done a few of those problems, I want to back up and refer to something that you did on your, on your most recent test. Um, okay, on a recent test, you had a question kind of like this, sort of. It said, hey, um, if my sine fraction is negative one half, what could the angle be? And here's what you all did. Y'all were like, hmm. Well, if the sine fraction's negative, if the sine fraction is negative, wouldn't the angle have to be down here or down here because of ASTC? Mm -hmm. And then what angle has a fraction of one half? Well, the reference would be pi over six. So I think the angle would have to be, let's see, pi over six in quadrant three is seven pi over six. Pi over 6 in quadrant 4 would be 11 pi over 6. Oh, wow, look. Huh, I got two answers. <coughs> Some of you took it a step farther and said, couldn't you add another revolution onto it? Had that question a couple times. Well, yeah, you could. But within one revolution, you had these two possibilities. 
Did I ever mention doing an inverse? <coughs> I didn't. This, the problem wasn't set up to do an inverse. We just kind of thought backwards, right? Over here, look how this is set up. It's kind of the same, sort of, right? Like, isn't this a sine fraction in our answer, our answers or angles? Mm -hmm. Aren't we given a sine fraction and our answer is supposed to be an angle? Mm -hmm. Here's the difference. This is already set up on my paper as a sine inverse. If it's already set up on my paper as a sine inverse, I have limitations. <clears throat> I have limitations. If the problem is set up like this, I have limitations. And therefore, oh, that's a positive one half. That was a negative one half. Whatever. Um, therefore, instead of any possibilities, I have to come from these two, and my answer is going to be in quadrant one only, and it's going to be pi over six. Because if the problem is set up this way, you have limitations, you can only have one answer. If the problem is written on your paper like that, you have limitations, you only, you only have one answer. This was kind of different. I, I get it. It's the same kind of process mentally, but it was not set up on your paper as an inverse. Kind of like this. What's the square root of 81? See how it's set up on my paper? It's 9. Why, why didn't I say it could also be negative 9? Because what's out in front of it? Nothing. Which means there's like a, it's represented with a positive. This is implied. So when, when this is already set up on your paper like this, you do exactly what it asks for. Give me the positive root of 81. Okay. What, what, if you, what if it's up to you to solve the problem? This type of problem, you have to go, oh, I'm going to square root both sides. When you decide to square root both sides, what do you have to remember to do? Yes, you do. You're the one that put the radical on the paper. You're the one that decided to square root the both sides. You're the one that has to remember the positive and the negative. It's up to you. Okay? When you do it, there's two answers. When it's already established, this is already written on the paper. There's no negative in front of it. Don't include the negative root. I hope that makes sense, like the, the distinction between the type of problems. This is the type of problem you're going to be doing today and tomorrow. All right. Um, let's try to wrap this up. The, those two, it's saying use a calculator because we don't have a 5. <laughs> we don't have a 2. We have like radical 3 over 2 and all that stuff. So I'm going to use a calculator. Just type it in. And I get tangent inverse of 5. I get approximately 1.37, and that's radians. It's okay. It's, it's weird. I get it. There's no pi in it. I mean, there is, but you don't see it. The pi has already been multiplied in, but that's an answer in radians. Cosine inverse of 2. Try it. See what you get. Whoa. Just type it in wrong. Try it again. Whoa. Just type it in wrong again. Why does your calculator keep telling you domain error? Remember this is a fraction? What? What? Huh. How is your cosine fraction made? Your cosine fraction is made by adjacent 
over hypotenuse. Hmm. Could your adjacent be two over a hypotenuse of one? No. This is too big for a cosine fraction. Cosine fractions cannot be bigger than one. So this is not possible. All right, let's finish this up. Uh, tangent inverse, set up your limitations. Keep in mind this is a fraction. We are looking for an answer that's an angle. Where is tangent negative? Well, tangent is negative here. This is the hard one, radical 3 over 3. It's the one that you had to get by fixing it every time. So my reference angle is going to be pi over 6. Right? Pi over 6 has that radical 1 over radical 3 that you fix. Now, take this. Give me the correct answer in quadrant 4. Remember, it's a negative acute angle. Don't go all the way around. Sine inverse is negative 1. All righty. This time, since my sine fraction is negative 1, it's going to be on an axis. And these are your only three choices. You can give me an angle of 0, you can give me an angle of positive pi over 2, or you can give me an angle of negative pi over 2. And since sine is y, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, negative 1, I think it's this one. Negative pi over 2. Cosine. Looking for an angle. Set up your limitations. Oh, nope, not for cosine. Wrong limitations. All right, now this time for cosine to be negative 1, it's going to be on one of these. It's going to be either 0, pi over 2, or pi. Remember, cosine is your x. So think about what your ordered pairs are. And I believe it's over here. So my answer is pi. All right, and I think here, your calculator just straight up gives you the answer. Yeah, it does. Um, so if you type this in, into your calculator, it's going to give you an answer in radians, if you're in radian mode. It's going to give you an answer in radians. 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 And it's funny, I kind of wish these were in degrees because I kind of want to talk to you about the correlation here, but this angle is an acute angle in quadrant 4. It's a negative acute angle. Well, that goes with what we know from our sine limitations and having a negative sine fraction. This angle is not quite negative 1.5, so it's in quadrant 4, and that goes with what I know about tangent limitations and a negative tangent fraction. This is a positive angle in quadrant 2. Again, we're in radians. Positive angle, quadrant 2. That goes with what I know about cosine limitations and having a cosine, uh, having a negative cosine fraction. All right, done, out of here. Thanks, guys.